Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We've got a very special guest today, Lawrence Krauss. You are a theoretical physicist, somebody whose work I've followed, you know, thanks to all the, I guess since the mid nineties, there's been a big push in publish, publishing in, in Discovery Channel and a lot of other places actually, just uh, particularly physics. I don't know why, I don't know where the big jump came from, but it got really popular for a while. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a lot of, um, in those years, in the 90s and 2000s, a lot of TV. And, and you know, I, I think the reason is that people are fascinated by the same questions that, that the forefront of physics is exploring, which is the point of, the point of my new book, in a sense, because the, the questions that are driving science at the edge of knowledge are the same questions that people have about the universe. You know, uh, why, are, are we alone? How did the universe begin? How did life begin? You know. All of those things. Well, I think the first thing I read of yours was um, I was in high school and I read the physics of Star Trek because I heard I don't remember who I first heard it heard use the phrase science fiction to science fact. It was sometime in that general time period. Yeah. But yeah. Um, like the ideas of uh, GPS, cell phones, all these things kind of came yeah. like all, so many things have have begun as science fiction. And we're like, hey, you know what? We can actually do that. Let's do that. Right. Yeah, no, it was a fun. It that was a fun book. You made me feel old, of course, by telling me you were in high school well. when it came up. But that's life. I am old. Um, and uh, uh, but yeah, I think the idea and the physics Star Trek was the first. It created a genre, but it, it, it you know it wasn't obvious to me in advance that it was a good idea. But it certainly was. But it, it's sort of the first book that tried to look at the compare the real universe to the science fiction universe, and and of course, in my opinion, the real universe is more fascinating. And, uh, and I remember, you know, yeah, Stephen Hawking wrote the foreword for that book because he was a Star Trek fan as well, a science fiction fan anyway. And, and, and it's, uh, I wonder, I always wonder, like a lot of people uh, like myself who joined the military, a lot of my friends who were Navy SEALs joined because of the movie Navy SEALs with Charlie oh. Sheen back in the day. Um, yeah. A lot of people joined because of the movie Black Hawk Down that was in the late 90s. Um, yeah. And obviously a lot of people joined because of 9-11, but a lot of people joined because you know, that stuff. And I wonder how many people got into physics and the science because of Star Trek. <laughs> I was Trek. Gonna say, how come you didn't go to become a scientist? No, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it, I, I don't know if the, there was a, um, a general influx uh, as a result of that, but, but there might've been, I mean, I think it was more in the fifties when, you know, there was that response to Sputnik, but, but I think, uh, um, you know, I think people are fascinated. It, it's an interesting thing. People are fascinated fascinated by the science, but also intimidated by it. And that combination keeps some people away, not only from becoming scientists, but the sad thing is it keeps them away from, 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 you know, reading about it, you know, and, and the whole point of, 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 of writing about these things is that, is that you don't have to be a scientific expert to appreciate and enjoy science any more than you have to be a guitar virtuoso to appreciate Eric Clapton. I sure, mean, yeah. it's really, uh, and yet somehow people think that and and I and, and partly scientists are to blame because you appear to be more mysterious and wonderful if the if what you're working on is I suppose uh, uh, it seems incomprehensible but but the ideas of science are some of the most fascinating ideas that that humans have ever come up with and it's such a shame that we don't share them more broadly and so many people are feel like they can't appreciate them because it it's a whole part of our culture and affected our culture I'd say more than almost any other cultural activity mm. including music and art and literature which i love but uh it's changed the way we think about ourselves and that's what culture is all about well i think over the past couple of decades maybe let's call it 30 years we've had quite a few good science communicators like we've had good scientists forever but how to finally have good because I'm, I'm not sure if you were to have uh if Leonardo da Vinci had a YouTube channel, if he would really be able, because some some of these folks just aren't yeah. the there, best. There are definitely a lot of scientists you want to keep off TV. There's yeah, sure, stuff. yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think in the U.S., I think Carl Sagan, you know, established yeah. the, uh, the paradigm there. I, I happen to like Jacob Bernowski, who was a British uh, science mm -hmm. novelist. But but you know, and I think I think many of us were were encouraged. Certainly the. Re I got interested in science because I read books about science, and that's one of the reasons why I write them. But I, but I was incredibly encouraged by people like uh, Sagan and, and Bernowski in particular mm. to think about ways to uh, 
um, explain science and to and and of course to do it in different media, including writing and TV and mm. and um, and other other venues. You know, music I've been involved in, and and it's it's uh, it's nice, and it's, I think it, I think. Um, well, with Stephen Haw, I think what happened when Stephen Hawking's book uh, became a big bestseller, I think a lot of people also thought that in writing books they'd make a lot of money, which is not a generally a true statement. Mm. Um, but it encouraged more scientists to at least it made it less seem less uh, pejorative to to have written a popular book. Sure, yeah, and then, uh, what what followed was um, quite a few of of you guys who I would consider to be great science communicators, Brian Green, Brian Cox, you know, Neil, there's just, there's so many, uh, uh, Michio Kaku, a lot of people that are pretty good at, you know, I mean, what, what the old Einstein quotes, like if you can't explain it to a, you know, to somebody that has no idea what you're talking about, yeah, you don't really understand yourself. I think that's a good measure for that kind of stuff because it's important for people to be scientifically literate and it doesn't seem like we're very scientifically literate anymore and not just with no, science fact, but worse, our, we're kind of anti-science yeah. where there, people are sort of talking about fake science and you know don't at least even though people used to steer away from science mm. it nevertheless surveys have been done that scientists were among the most trusted people anywhere even though people didn't you know didn't it avoided science and i'm not sure that's the case anymore and, that, and that's and that's sad but it's 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 um it's important work, and I'm happy to have you know be a, in that group of people that you you know you mentioned, and and, and to have achieved some um, to have an impact. It's nice to know you have an impact to hear from someone like you about reading the physics of Star Trek when you're seen. Or other, actually, for me, even more exciting, perhaps, is I, I'm old enough that I, I I know of kid people who've said I read your books when I was a kid, and that made me want to become a scientist. Sure, well, because well, that's exactly returning the favor. It was reading hmm. books by Richard Feynman and Albert okay. Einstein and George Gamow. Um, that got me inter- interested in science in the first place. And so it's nice to return the favor. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Everybody's got their own journey, but it seems like a lot of folks in the scientific community are either, um, uh, you know, they, they, there's some origin story of some sort. There was a problem that they wanted to solve or there was a person that they looked up to or they just were really into math and that's the best way they felt to apply it or something. But what was it for you? Well, it's hard to know in retrospect, of course. I can mm-hmm. invent arguments, but but... Part of it was simply, first off, that my mother wanted me to be a doctor. She wanted my brother to be a lawyer and me to be a doctor. Neither of my parents had finished high school. And it was the trip, typical thing that she wanted her kids to be professionals. My brother later became a lawyer, which added pressure. Um, so thinking of myself, thinking about becoming a doctor, my mom, I think, made the mistake of telling me that doctors were scientists. Um, like, I understood science. All kinds of science early on. I had a neighbor whose son, he was an engineer and his son was, and I talked about things. And then uh, I do remember vividly reading a book. Um, actually, it was part of a special program I was in, but when I was in, just in elementary school, when I was 11 year old, years old, I read a book about Galileo. And that really was an ins- initial inspiration because it seemed, he seemed so heroic. And I thought, wow, I want to be a her- hero like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not, science isn't so heroic all the time, but it got me interested. And then and then it was, you know, it was a, a an epiphany at some point. I'm not a positive one. When I suddenly realized that doctors weren't scientists and I didn't want to become a doctor, it was, my mother was disappointed for decades. But uh, um, even after the PhD from MIT, MIT, she was still disappointed. Come on, man, that's a pretty big. Oh, you know, she yeah, no, I got my first job at Harvard, which was among <laughs> the most prestigious places. Like, and my mother at the time phoned my wife at the time at, the day I was I got the job offer and said you know, he can still go to medical school. <laughs> so she, she persisted for quite a while. But uh, um, it was uh, it, it, after, after, you know, getting turned on in science, it really was reading scientists. And, and, and as a story I relate at the end of the new book is um, it, it, it happened to me in high school. I remember I was at a special science program for good students, I guess. And um, the teacher still saw I was bored and, and came down and gave me a book by Richard Feynman called The Character of Physical Law. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time I realized that it hadn't all been done already, in a sense, that it wasn't, you know, the great work hadn't been done by Einstein and all those other people. Of course it had been done, but there were still a tremendous number of open questions. And I saw it as an invitation to, hey, maybe I could contribute. And, you know, I've tried in my scientific career and I think I've done that a few times. But, but again, my hope is my hope but not necessarily expectation is that maybe 
my book about the open questions in the universe will, might inspire some young kid today to say, hey, that's an invitation for me to, to take things to the next level. Sure. Yeah, to, well, it's, yeah. it's almost a, a, a copycat field by necessity because you've got to find funding places to do your research, right? And funding is generated in a lot of ways by just the popularity of whatever you happen to be working on at the time. Well, there is, a, there is that aspect. There is that, you know, there's the faddish aspect to some extent. But I, I think um, happily, well, funding also tends to also, you know, be centered in places that are well known mm -hmm. where you have a little more flexibility. My position at Harvard, for example, uh, what just gave me allowed me to do whatever i want uh, it's a three-year kind of i didn't have to teach i i could just do whatever i wanted and that was that's kind of freeing although it also imposes a kind of pressure on you to do something great but uh um well that's good pressure creates and, and, you know right? and, and also happily in at least in theoretical work it, you know you don't need a lot of funds you, you just mm. need it well i used to just need a pen to, yeah, yeah. now you need a computer <laughs> it's great to have students and stuff we sure, want yeah. support but then the the, the the amount of funding you need is less than, than it is to do the experimental work, which now is huge. I mean, you know, the cost of the Large Hadron Collider, big particle experiments or big astronomical experiments, telescopes, satellite missions is in the millions, if not billions of dollars. Uh, yeah, especially, um, you know, Fermilab, CERN, some of these programs are, they're, they're gobbling up a lot of money, but they're also making some pretty big discoveries. And you've you well, have. yeah, and and you know, it's a lot. It, when you say it's a lot of money, it is a lot of money. Of course, I, you know, in in, in a in a objective sense, but mm -hmm. in a relative sense, it's not a lot of money. I mean, so so the this large hadron collider cost maybe ten billion dollars mm -hmm. over the ten or twenty years that it was being built. Right. Okay. And and same thing and, with James uh, Webb, right? I mean, it was thirty years yeah, to build that thing. Yeah, same, same, same. Sort of ten billion dollars, like the mm -hmm. quantum of the large project. So six to ten billion. It mm -hmm. was over cost overruns, but hey, you know that's that's less than a billion a year, which sounds like a lot of money. But if you think about the amount of money, that's less than the cost of xeroxing in the Department of Defense, probably, and 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 certainly less than the cost of of and and, and you know if you were in the an Navy SEAL, less than the cost of a of a of a major modern aircraft, mm -hmm. a single one, and and again, I don't want to minimize it, but if if you think about that, you know, the percentage of the amount of money that the government is spending, if we can't afford to spend a, a, a extremely small fraction of the of the gross national product on answering or on asking fundamental questions about the universe, then we're in really sad shape. It seems to me. Sure. Aside from just the academic part of that, the amount that these programs cost, like CERN, James Webb, uh, let's say NASA, more broadly speaking, or, um, you know, global satellite arrays and things like that to take pictures of deep space. But especially NASA, it, it's always irked me that we've stopped funding that because um, <clears throat> the cost pale in comparison to the discoveries that we've that that have happened and not not just knowing the information but how they've advanced our civilization you know what i mean it's and especially you know it, it, on a long enough timeline we're not going to be able to just stay on earth right if we want humanity to survive we're going to have to go other places carl say on a long a time of that. frame i don't think it's necessary in the next couple of years but yeah oh, no 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 we're talking about yeah, probably i mean I'm, you know i'm not as enthusiastic as some people are about you know sending people to mars right away but mm. but uh but you're right and in, and you know i don't think you should fund projects based on their side benefits but you know there have been a lot of them i mean take the large Hadron collider the, the particle physics the cern where that was built um was where the World Wide web was built so that many you know teams of thousands of physicists could communicate to each other effectively basically produce the modern internet well that's changed the world mm -hmm. but I, I i don't think that's the reason you justify the large Hadron collider you justify it because it'll teach us you know why we're here but basically or how we got here why the world is the way it is. And, you know, science produces a lot of technology. Obviously, that all the, te the technology that allows you and I to have this conversation and pretty well everything that governs our lives from the minute we wake up. But that's a part of science. In a, in a way, I almost say it's unfortunate that science does that because then people, if something doesn't produce technology, people say, well, what good is it? Mm. You know, what good is it to understand the beginning of the universe? But when you take the rest of art, music, you know, modern culture, a Picasso painting, what use is that? A Mozart symphony, what use is that? A great novel. Well, they all have great uses because they, 
they enhance being human and they change our perspective of our place in the cosmos. And that's exactly what science does. So I think the ideas of science are at least as important as the technology. Uh, so why do you think, <clears throat> because ordinary people who, uh, you know, people that are taxpayers paying for things and stuff like that, uh, I wish they were this uh, scrutinizing when it came to our normal budget, you know what I mean? Like our, <laughs> our, our defense budget and some of the other dumb shit we do. Um, yeah. uh, but they're, they're going to ask for some practical reason for, to do this. So why do you think it's important for us? How would you explain to an ordinary person why it's important for us to understand what, why the universe is the way it is? Because right well, now, um, just to lay the groundwork for that, for right now, 96% of all matter in the universe is dark matter. We don't know what the hell that means exactly, right? So Yeah, yeah. Like well, yeah. most of the matter in the universe is dark matter. And what's even stranger is most of the energy in the universe resides in empty space. It doesn't right. even matter. <laughs> you take empty space and get rid of all the stuff and it weighs something. And, and that's the mm. biggest mystery in science. Well, you know, when people talk about that, there's lots of answers I could give. But one of my favorite comes from Robert Wilson, who was a... Uh, first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, mm -hmm. a large particle accelerator in the United States. And when it was being built, he was asked to testify before Congress. And um, and one of the questions was, does it help aid in the, in, in national defense? And and um, he said, no, but it helps make the country worth defending. Mm. Okay. I mean, because again, if we, if, if we just stop asking questions, if we stop pushing the forefronts of human inquiry, it's 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 ultimately the end of culture. Hmm. Uh, questions are the are, are are the driving force of humanity. All progress comes from asking questions, and 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 that uh, questions of all types. And also, you know, curiosity-driven research. Again, while I don't like to justify based on the side benefits, curiosity-driven research. It's been shown that fifty percent of the gross national product of the United States is based on curiosity-driven research. Uh, uh, a generation before, hmm. you know, for everything from the discovery of antibiotics to the development of the transistor and modern computers all didn't involve people specifically doing that application, but but in fact, thinking about more fundamental questions and 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 these side benefits came across. So pushing the edge of the leading edge of technology, as well as the leading edge of, tech, of science is always a good investment, at least if history is any guide. Sure. I mean, and, um, so our, our technological yeah, so there's the economic advancement. aspect, but for me, there's the cultural intellectual aspect. It's like it, it, stopping it is like saying, OK, we're not going to produce music anymore. We won't, can't listen to music anymore. Yeah. Well, for many people, that would just be their lives would be changed dramatically or you can't read books or or see movies and, and science. Actually, and you know what? People think that science is out there. But, but as I say, most people don't realize the questions they're asking are scientific questions. When I used to go to parties when I was younger and say, you know, I say I'm a physicist and they say, oh, how about those Yankees or something to change the conversation. But, but if I talk to them, that's the reason I wrote the physics of Star Trek. Mm. If I talk about warp drive or time travel, they were fascinated because that inhibition had gone away, that barrier had gone away and people and the people didn't realize that those questions that interest them are, are in fact the questions we think about as scientists and and it's that merging of questions um that caused me to write the new book the edge of knowledge which is about what what we know we don't know about the universe which is about the questions that are driving science today and it's and the very fact that they're the same questions that you and i ask even in our regular life every day sure yeah i mean if you um <laughs> If you were to ask even um, like just a regular person with, uh, you know, not, not someone with advanced degrees or anything, or maybe not even somebody with a college degree to name some of the more famous people throughout human history, it's going to be leaders and despots, musicians, artists, writers, and then scientists. Those are the only three groups of people that will routinely pre-industrial revolution come up on a regular basis, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think, and I do, you're right, and there are a few scientists like Einstein that most people will recognize, and and most people happily recognize, say, Stephen Hawking now, but, um, although I've met some academic administrators who don't know who he is, but they're generally <laughs> brain dead. Anyway. <laughs> well, academic, so that's a good point about academia. Um, 
the uh, relative to inflation, I think the average professor salary has gone up about 30% over the last 40 years. And uh, administrative fees at universities have gone up about 2,000%. That's the... the yeah, yeah, well, not just that. The sad thing is that, especially when it comes to bureau, uh, sort of the biggest bureaucracy that's growing universities, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it, um, not just the salary, but the, the, the amount of money spent on mm -hmm. it. They, they, many universities have far more officers in that area, in, the, in that bureaucracy, than they do faculty. Uh, it, the, they grow they grow exponentially and 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 it's it takes away money from all the other aspects of the university that what the university should be doing many people yeah. are concerned about it. i certainly you, am. i'm sure you've got thoughts on this i talk to a lot of people that work in academia now uh brian keating's a good buddy of mine he talks about it a lot i like why do you think I guess I understand it from the liberal arts perspective, but it's also infected STEM. And that, that is what concerned me because this, this is like meritocratic science. This isn't high lofty thinking stuff where you're trying to figure out the why or the, I'm sorry, the, 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 uh, the uh, wow. philosophical, you know, mm -hmm. answer to things. This is, this is numbers, right? It's either ones and zeros or it's quantum theory, right? So how the hell did this weird stuff get in, intertwined into this? I think you know, look. It's a good question. When I when I taught at Yale uh, for almost a decade, science was on this hill called Science Hill. It seemed appropriate to us at the time. Most many Yale students never even walked up there during the entire career at Yale. But we used to look down that hill and we'd see the English department, which was full of deconstructionists and postmodernists, and we'd laugh because we'd say, "Well, you know, that's never going to happen to science." And then it's happening, and I I think it's happening. It's, I think it started in a well-meaning sense. You know, postmodernism is based on sort of not just social contract context, but this this interleaving web of oppression and victimization and 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 and, and power. And I think you know, in in response to concerns about you know equity, and um, people start to think about it. And then what happened was that that began to take a life of its own and, and, and bureaucracies began to multiply and it was in their interest. It's in their interest to show that there are problems, even when there aren't problems, because otherwise they don't get funded and they can't grow. So they constantly find evidence for systemic biases that actually scientific studies haven't found. And, um, uh, you know, I, I was, at, we've been working on on um on equity and inclusion if you want to call that for 40 years i was chair of a physics department for almost 15 years in the, in the 1980s and and well 1990s and um and even then uh, just for example if we didn't hire if we had a faculty search and we didn't hire a women woman we had to write a letter explaining why that was the case and i you know i supported that we actually hired some of the first women in, in our department, but that's been going on for a long time, you know, and it's not as if it's not as if sudden, it's not as if the situation, oh, suddenly people are finding that, oh, there's these, the, these uh, barriers. There are, there are essentially no barriers. And in fact, it's, it's, it, there, it, it, it's, there are, a recent study showed that uh, hiring fem women have an easier time getting hired right now in academia than men. And certainly, and, and it, that's that's also happening at the undergraduate level. Unfortunately, for some reason, young men are going to university. And mm. um, but I think I think it began as well-meaning stuff. And then and then this the, the, this this religious social justice think this idea that they knew the answers. They before you ask the questions, you know that X is the cause of this without without looking at the problem. And you'd think as scientists, that would be the last thing people would do, but that's what's taken over. And you find leaders um, uh, who are who say that, you know, this, this, I've always broke me up and Francis Collins, who's a, someone I know well, uh, uh, was the head of the National Institute mm -hmm. of Human uh, Genome. Map the uh, human oh. genome. But, we, yeah, but I mean, the biggest funded government science mm -hmm. area in the world, NIH, is far bigger than any other area. He said, well, biomedical science is infested with systemic racism. Like, first of all, uh, without any evidence. And secondly, I, I feel like saying, well, if that's true, you should resign. Mm. You've been a, you've been director of it for a decade, you know, and, and but it's it's just these blanket statements that are made without um, without clear evidence. And, um, 
you know, universities are uh, uh, the most um, have been the most progressively enlightened areas in the world. This concern, these concerns about you know safe zones and everything else. It's it's it, all of this multiplying. And the big problem is uh, you hit you pushed a button with me because I no, keep going. I like it. And I, and I, but is is the leaders, academic leaders who have no spine? It is much easier to virtue signal and try and be in front of the social mobs and say, yeah, we are more, yeah, we're more enlightened. We're, you know, we're, we, we, whatever it is, we'll be at the leading edge because there's no downside to doing that. Instead of saying, you know what, we, we believe in free speech and academic freedom. And we, and we, uh, we, we don't put barriers in people's ways. We try and encourage them and have been doing it for 20 years. That doesn't play as well as saying, oh my goodness, we need to do better and we need, and we, we're guilty. Anyway, enough of that. Maybe. No, well, I mean, it's, I think it's important because, you know, <clears throat> things have gotten a little bit off the rails here lately. You know, I, you I, know, I, I, well, I, I read about it a lot. I mean, I, it, look, the main point is, and really for what concerns me more than that, and I've written my first piece, I remember a few years ago, and that happened to me in the Wall Street Journal on this the ideological corruption of science. Ideology should have no place in science. Mm. Scientific questions, any scientific question should be ask, askable, and the answers should be tested, and um, and there should be no room for uh, for ideology about what you know what kind of things you can you can ask, uh, and who should be able to ask it. Uh, and and if that happens, and it's happened in the Soviet Union mm. in the old days. Uh, with, with uh, in their genetics program, which caused mass starvation mm -hmm. in uh, Senko in, in 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 Russia, and people have written about that. Same thing it's with Mao in China. It used to happen in China. Yep. Um, and uh, and when that happens, you, you science suffers. And if it happens here, you're going to see science suffer. Here. It's already happening to some extent. People are hung up on debates about uh, what you, you know what's the right thing to say in a scientific paper that might not offend people and and send and, and well while, while researchers in singapore or china or or korea are are pushing ahead sure and so um it really uh, more than this hiring issue it, it, we need no question is sacred mm. no 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 statement is sacred and everything is subject to question and and that's what academia is all about and that's certainly what science is all about that's you know I said in my new book, the, the most important three words in science are, I don't know, but they're the most important three words in society. I just opened an op-ed piece saying, if that notion, scientists love saying, I don't know, if it propagated into pop, in, into popular culture, into institutions and into the, in, into the, the commons, then the world would be a better place. Because people are saying, I know that X, Y, or Z, I know it. Like you can't question it. I know this is, is true, whether this, you know racism is endemic or something else i know it and you can't even ask the question well that's that's religious but if you just were willing to say you know maybe i'm not sure maybe this other person who disagrees with me might be right and i don't know the answer i think if all of us just said i don't know we'd find suddenly this culture war that we're in the midst of disappearing yeah it's weird anyway. I, the the inability to admit you don't know something seems to be a lost art you know what i mean um like it, that, I, I never understood why people are so romantically as, uh, attached to whether or not they're currently right about something. Because the, mm -hmm. the goal should be to be right, right? So everything I know, everything that I'm currently right about, I was either ignorant about or wrong about up until the point I was right about it. And there was no, yeah. there's no judgment to be made there. That is just a statement of fact, right? Yeah. yeah. So you, exactly. should be, you should be pleased when you are proven wrong and then become part it's of the correct group, right? It, well, not just that, saying I don't know or, or, or I'm wrong is an invitation to discover. Mm. That's the point. It was that invitation that turned me on when I was a high school student. It, it, the, it, the, the, the fact when I say the known unknowns, the fact with the edge of knowledge that there are things we don't know is an invitation to people to say, well, wow, maybe we can go that next step. And you're right. Uh, teachers, I've often said teachers and parents should be willing to say I don't know, much less pro politicians, of course, they'll never say that. But uh, um, it, it, it really is an invitation to say, well, I don't know, let's figure it out. Let's work together to figure it out. And uh, uh, it, there is, it used to be that religion was one of the 
few places where, where you weren't allowed to, where you knew the answers before you asked the questions. And now there's this ideology or secular religions where you're, you know, the answers, the answers aren't, can't, it's called dogma. Mm. You can't question it. And then you have to work from there. And, 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 and it's, and no one gets to be like the, it's like the emperor's new clothes. I have a, I've, I've shielded his body behind me, but I had an award for the, I got the emperor's new clothes award many years ago. And, um, and that's a big, you know, naked emperor mm. there. And, um, and, you know, until some little kid said, oh, hold on, you know, I just don't think he's got clothes on. Everyone just, you know, said we have to, you know, he has clothes and we have to proceed from there. And, and the thing about it, it's okay. It, it, it causes harm and damage in society, but in science, it's immediate. Mm. It, you know, if immediately, if you, if ideology and, and, and it enters into science and you constrain the results, you get theories that are wrong and just don't work. And that it, it, they're obvious that they don't work. And, and the results, as I say, are immediate. So that's why science is, is self um, healing in that sense, because it, it's based on what works. It's based on a dialectic where, where, where you confront ideas and see if they work and don't work with experiments. And, and, um, and if people, you know, are making claims based on what they want, the, the, the false, the, 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 techno, the experiments they produce, you know, immediately fail. And so it's it, that feedback in science is immediate. And that's why um, if ideology continues to pervade science, it'll just hold it back. Why, why do you think it's become, um, and I know for a lot of you, it's not the case, but throughout all of human history, all of, uh, uh, at least through civilization, maybe not through all of human history, but through civilization, um, it's typically been the state or the church, one of those two institutional powers that have tried to capture the scientific community and, and doctor the results or shield the results in a lot of cases or whatever. And then this, you know, the last couple of years, there have been a lot of people in the science and medical community who have been pretty like unwilling to challenge state narratives for some reason. And that seems bizarre to me, to be honest. Well, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, power, money, uh, fear of, of reprisal that I, I think that I know, I know how scary since I've done it, I know how scary it is in the go out in the public arena and challenge conventional notions. But I think your history is not absolutely right there. In fact, it, it, it is true that the church got in the way of knowledge to some extent, but the church was also the only option for people who wanted to learn anything. I mean, all of the early universities, you, you couldn't, they were all created by the church. So in the old days, it was the only game in town, Newton and others. Newton may have been one of the greatest scientists in all time, but he must spend most of his time trying to, trying to decipher secrets of the Bible. Mm. You know, science was almost a hobby for him, and 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 then same with government. Government is go, government because science has become large. Private industry can no longer support the scientific enterprise, and government is the only option. It began with the Manhattan Project in the United States, and and there are a lot, especially if the the benefits are long term away. You can't expect industry to to be spending money. Government is the only way we can support science on large scales. So it's true that, you know, governments have their vested interests and, and various administrations have, and I've, I've spoken up about a bunch of them, uh, uh, various administrations have, have shielded, have censored the truth and other things when it got in the way of their agenda, standard in politics. But at the same time, um, government is the main supporter of the science that's, uh, even the, you know, even the science that's, that people are saying private industry is doing now, like, uh, say, spacecraft with Elon mm -hmm. Musk. Well, they are the benefits of 40 years of, of government spending on, on uh, paving the way for private industry to now have near Earth orbital uh, flights. And so, uh, it's, you know, to, it's for people who think government shouldn't be involved in science, that would be a big mistake because most of it wouldn't be done. Sure, yeah. Uh, and so that, I agree with that. And that's kind of, <clears throat> if you accept that fact, then you have to move, you have to move on from there and say, okay, so how can we still get done what needs to get done, right? Uh, without too much interference, because there's never going to be none. That's why I like having people on, like yourself to communicate these things to people, because the average citizen, there, there's an old adage in, in politics, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, as you mentioned before, we see some of the 
direct and immediate impacts of bad science or ignoring science altogether. Um, <clears throat> Mao's China is one of them. Russia, obviously, with their uh, 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 their issues with with starvation as well. And not just that, but the the climate that they created before Chernobyl, where nobody wanted to actually tell the truth because they were afraid of what might happen. And then you have a nuclear meltdown. There, there's a lot. Well, of, there's very obvious and immediate impact from bad science. And I think people well, should be. Yeah, aware and of that. you know, actually, we've been fortunate because of it in one sense. Um, it, it, it's quite likely that had it, had there been a free uh, uh, a, a atmosphere of free and open inquiry in Nazi Germany and science, mm. they would have developed an atomic bomb. Sure, and they didn't, you know. Mm. And so we we benefited from that. And uh, in, 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 but anyway, maybe that's not the best example, but it happens. Uh, yeah, I mean, every now and again, uh, I guess things work out the right way. So this new book, um, the known unknowns, uh, the unsolved mysteries of the cosmos. Um, That's what it's called in the UK. In the US, it's called uh, the right behind me, the edge of knowledge. The edge of knowledge. That's the it's it's the known known unknowns. The edge of knowledge, or just the the edge of knowledge. Well, no, the known unknowns is the title in the, in London mm. in the United Kingdom, and the title is the edge of knowledge in the US. Why? Because actually, my US publishers didn't want a quote from Donald Rumsfeld on the cover. <laughs> oh my God! Oh boy! What did he call it? The uh, the red slice, I think. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm not. A, I look. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a huge fan of Donald Rumsfeld, but <laughs> yes, yeah, he did say something intelligent <laughs> once, at least, and it was this wonderful statement about there are things we know we know, mm. there are things we know we don't know, and then there are things we don't know we don't mm. know. In this case, it was Iraq. He didn't realize that, but um, but uh, uh, but the but the known unknown. I mean, I would love to write a book up on the unknown unknowns because they're the the most interesting ones. But it'd be a very short book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so. The known unknowns, which is really, you know, as I say, the edge of knowledge, the two are together because the known unknowns are the edge of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and and anyway, and that's that's the subject of my new book. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, anyway. no, no, it's good. No, it's got good. Thank you for correcting me, because most of our uh, audiences in America, obviously, I, and, uh, I can't imagine very many of them, uh, since a lot of them have served in the military, are huge fans of Donald Rumsfeld either, because he kind of fucked, <laughs> he kind of fucked us over a little bit. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me, uh, what what are the none the known? We we talked about dark energy and matter, but what are some of the known unknowns that you cover well, in this book? Let, let let me put it in perspective. So okay. what I tried to do is look at the biggest areas in science, and as I say connect to people because they're the biggest areas in what in what all of us ask questions. So it's divided into five sections, time, space, matter, life, and consciousness. And those are the big questions, everything from how did the universe begin and to what are we made of? Uh, are there other universes out there? Are we alone in the universe? You know, the other forms of life, how did life originate? And the conscious, if I see green, is it the same as your green? The same central questions. And it's really kind of amazing how those fundamental questions persist in science. So there's, you know, what I did in each chapter, and this is the British version that happens to be the mm -hmm. own no title. But I, you know, I, I, I listed a series of questions at the beginning of each chapter. The time chapter, for example, is, is time universal? Does time have a beginning? Can time end? Is time travel possible? And each chapter, I tried to take a series of questions that are central to humans and central to science um, and, and, and talk about what we know. And it's a celebration, not of ignorance, but how far we've come. And then, you know, where, where we, you know, the fascinating things that still remain mysterious. Anyway. Sure. I mean, really. And, and so dark energy, of course, is one of the deepest mysteries in astrophysics, but a mystery about time is, you know, can you travel backwards in time? That's a big question. Time sure. and space are unified by, by general relativity, if I can go on a circle to London and back, which I'll do next week, um, why can't I go on a circle in time? And so that's another, you know, big question. And so it, it, not just in, and then when you come consider the universe, not just dark energy, but is our universe unique? Is, are we one of an infinite number of universes in a multiverse? And uh, if so, how how might we get some evidence, or even indirect evidence, even if there's no direct evidence we can ever get? And I've worked on that, and. Um, and, and what's the future of life and how likely is it that, that life will persist in the future? And is the universe designed for us? And, and once again, how will I know if there's life elsewhere in the universe? Those, mm. are, those are some big questions, as well as the deep questions of consciousness. What makes us us? What mm. makes you and I have the sense of self, which, which many philosophers say is an illusion, but I say it doesn't matter. 
Some scientists also say time is an illusion, but I say that doesn't matter either because if you're late for the 515 train to work, it, it, you know, if I go up to you and say it was an illusion, it, it doesn't really help you much. And similarly, when it comes to consciousness, if I kick you in the shins or you're jilted by a lover, then the sense of self saying, oh, don't worry, it's just an illusion, doesn't really help. No, I think, uh, yeah, I like, I like that. I think time is the, is time and consciousness are the two most interesting things to me because. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I, I think they are to a lot of people and they bookend mm. the book for that partly for that reason. Sure. Also, because I think it co goes, it may, it may not sound like it. I often say, I used to joke on stage, but I wasn't really joking uh, that I do physics because it's easy. You know, I'm not a biologist because mm -hmm. physics is easy and people don't laugh because physics sounds so hard. But, you know, consciousness is probably the hardest problem of all. And I left it for the end for that reason. And the hardest to learn about, the hardest to do experiments in. And and uh, even though, yeah, sure, physics has made leaps and bounds and, and, and it seems complicated, in some ways it's much easier to probe the universe than it is to probe our own brains. Especially since probing our own brains has a, a very large degree of self-reporting, which is unreliable to say the least, right? Yeah, and I talk about, you know, there's a great experiment I talk about in that chapter of that book um, by Michael Gazonaga and his uh, uh, colleagues. There's a called a split brain experiment. And um, it, it, it had to do with the fact that in, um, in the, the brain has two hemispheres, left and right hemispheres, and they're connected by something called a corpus callosum. And which and apparently women have bigger ones than men, which is why my wife tells me all the time that I can't multitask. But anyway, um, uh, it turns out our left visual field is handled in the right brain, part of our brain and our right visual field is handled, um, everything we see in the right eye is come, handled in the left part of your brain. Similarly, with tactile, left handled in the right part of the brain, right with the, 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 in the left part of the brain. But speaking is in the left part of the brain only. Now, what they used to do, and I'm not sure if they still do it, was for, to treat epileptic people seizures, certain epileptic, they would sever the corpus callosum because it would reduce the, 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 the severity of the seizures and otherwise not have a huge impact on people. Certainly the impact was less negative than, than the epileptic seizures were. But that, of course, gave scientists, gave brain scientists a great chance. Let's do some tests on people where the left and right brain can't communicate. And, and it, there's a wonderful experiment, which I won't go into for lack of time here, but it involves having people look at screens where the left eye can only see one thing, the right eye can see mm -hmm. another, and your hands can, you know, take up objects that relate to see what, what you see on the screen. And, and people would see a snow scene in one hand and a chicken claw in another, and they take up with their hand a, um, a, uh, a shovel in one hand and, and, a, and, a, and a little rubber chicken in the other, and because they're both, the left hemisphere was uh, visually and hands were both seeing the right and vice versa. But then when asked to say, why did they, why did they pick up the shovel and the claw? The speaking only is a left hemisphere. So it had no access to the image that of, of the snow scene on the left. So people would say, well, I picked up the, the, the chicken because of the, of the claw and I picked up the shovel. So, cause I would have to clean out the chicken coop. And, you know, so people would actually say that. Mm. So consciously their consciousness would say that they weren't lying. That's what they thought the case was, uh, because their left, you know, brain would make up an uh, uh, an argument um, to you know, so they could speak it. Even and and so we're not even aware mm. of how of of what's going on in our consciousness, and therefore self-reporting is, well, while it's not useless, is uh, is subject to question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty that's pretty interesting. That, I mean, just just thinking about that. It is, isn't it? I mean, I think it's experiment. fascinating. That's why I reported on that yeah. thing. You realize how out of touch we are, and it's and it, and there's many more examples. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I say, I think at the end of the book that you know it's not clear we'll ever be able to explore our consciousness directly. We sure I have two dogs sleeping next to me right here, <laughs> and it's not it's not clear even though they certainly seem conscious. That I can't probe their consciousness. I like to think they. They understand. They look like they're bored with what I'm saying right now, but um, uh, but I don't know. But maybe and 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 the the great physicist who first got me excited about modern science, Richard Feynman, once said, "If if you can't build it, you don't understand it." Mm. 
And I suspect the only way we might eventually understand it about how consciousness arises might be by building conscious systems. And, and you know, I and people are worried about AI now, but it's nowhere near conscious. But but uh, and I'm not as worried about it mm. as some people. You know, there are worries, but but you have to temper them. But it may be the only way eventually that we'll learn about consciousness and it will change. And if we create a conscious system, there's no doubt it's going to change the world and it could change it for the worse, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to. And um, it doesn't have to be the Terminator, you know, movies. It, it could be something else. And and the example I use at the end of the book, which I think it gives you a his historical perspective, is Plato in the in the in the ninth century B.C., the um, um, uh, writing was introduced basically in, into the Greek language mm. over the next few centuries. And Plato and others said writing is going to be the end of storytelling, the end of memory, because you won't be able to have to remember and you can read it and you won't be able to talk to people face to face. Well, writing hasn't destroyed story storytelling. I think of the world with books, since I write books, I'm biased, mm. but the world with books is better than a world without books. And so, yeah, when, when AI, you know, if AI, maybe not AI, but if some systems become conscious it'll it'll change things and even uh, even before that it'll change things but every time we develop new technologies it changes things. with cars it changes things with fire it changes things my the, the the smartphones change things so we we evolve and you know sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse but but uh the future remains to be seen and and that's one of the things we don't know what the future is I yeah. don't make predictions about the future. I'm, for that I'm not terribly I don't trust concerned. Say they're futurists. Uh, yeah, I'm not terribly concerned about AI. I think people watch too many movies, to be honest. But it's that's that's well, how we handle everything. Whether it's like the the only climate change discussions that really get any press are the worst possible scenarios, and it's the same thing with AI. It's like the the truth yeah. is almost always somewhere in the middle. Yeah, the truth, the world. Well, that's because we can't predict the future. That's because science fiction isn't as interesting as science, and science right. fiction. Yeah. They, you know, said be, I'd be in flying cars when I was, you know, in, the, in 2000 and I wasn't, but they didn't predict the internet. And yeah, so it's hard to predict the future, but, but you can't, but as Louis Pasteur once said, fortune favors the prepared mind. And it is important to realize that AI has some, some real challenges and potential issues, not, not but for ending the world necessarily, but for changing economics, for replacing people in jobs and that sort of thing. And if we don't think about that and the implications of that, we're going to find ourselves in a position where where the job structure changes dramatically without us having a safety net in any way to take uh, to cover all the people who no longer have an excuse for working in their old area. Sure. You know, in the Industrial Revolution, um, one of the early economists um, um, whose name escapes me at the moment once said that, um, you know, it, it, the industrial revolution should be great because you know it'll free people give people more time more leisure time and of course you know what it did is it concentrated wealth in certain areas and other people were out of work and you know it'd be great if computer if ai did many of our jobs if it freed us up to enjoy the fruits of that increased productivity mm. and we could go to coffee shops and listen to music and have conversations and so we can choose the future in some sense but i suspect we're going to find that the companies that most effectively utilize AI are going to have more of the profits and, and, sure. and, and it's going to centralize wealth, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, humanity has been more or less defined by finding your purpose and then trying to achieve it, right? Whether it's discovery or what, or, or even just having a family, right? It's that, that tends to be the thing that defines us in the end. So I think yeah, that, and, that's not going to go by away. The way, and, and more importantly, because it happens in science as well as in life, it's um, it's trying to achieve your purpose and then finding out it isn't your real purpose. Right. Uh, and, what... and that's that that happens all the time in business and science. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to realize that often you end up in a blind alley. And and but what you've it turns out the question you were asking wasn't good at answering what you wanted, but it might mm -hmm. be useful for for dealing with another problem. Well, one, that's, that's basically the story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? And then two, yeah. it's like one of my favorite quotes ever from T.S. Eliot. It says, we shall not cease from exploration. And the at the end of all of our exploring, we'll arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. It's one of my very favorite quotes. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I used it in one of my books, mm -hmm. one of my earliest books. I love that quote from the four quartets, I mm -hmm. think. Yep, that's right. Um, and... Uh, uh, you're right, and and that's it, and and it's knowing our the place for the first time, and it it harps back to what I said at the very beginning. 
science changes our perspective on mm. ourselves. And w as we learn new things about the universe, what it does is it changes our perspective of, of who we are and why we're here. And that's why the, 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 the edge of knowledge and the fundamental questions, in my mind, are so fascinating and why I think it's worth talking about them to the general public and why everyone, I mean, I suppose you say why everyone should buy the book, but mm. that's not really the point. It's why those issues are not just for scientists, they're for everyone, because they enhance what it means to be human. And I think that's probably a good, good way to end this problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, th I really appreciate your time today. It's been a great conversation. Um, everybody check out the book, The Edge of Knowledge, Unsolved Mysteries of the Cosmos. And if you read that one and like it, there's plenty of other ones that were written before that, that you'll enjoy as well. I've read quite a few of them. So again, oh, thank you. That. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. And, and let me know when this is, it comes out and I'll, I will. And I'll, and I'll, I'll tweet about it. You too. Have a good day. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Sure. And Bye -bye. thank you all for listening. This has been Citizen.